So Tadaki, can we talk a little bit about your training at um, Tokyo University of Fine Arts? And you obviously went underwent a traditional Nihonga training. Did you find that quite constricting, although you did obviously go on to use some of the techniques you learnt there in terms of mineral pigment and the use of the paper, but was it quite constricting for your, the approach that you wanted to adopt? Yeah, Nihonga technique is you know, completely different. That's the traditional one. And I didn't know when I get in the school. And uh, I learned over there. And uh, this is a dry pigment with uh, uh, glue, uh, animal glue, to mix it. That's only I knew. And, uh, but, you know, the world is very traditional, like uh, old fashioned, uh, like a kind of a group, existing group. And uh, master is there, and uh, some, you know, follow the student or something. And uh, first, about uh, half a year, I gave up. <laughs> And uh, I was, you know, thinking about art. They are not art. They are technique and group. Everything go by the rule. And had you seen, while you were still in Japan, had you seen any American or European art? Because there were a few exhibitions, I think, in 51. and. 56, where Pollock and Dubuffet and some of the informel group had shown in Japan. Had you, did you see any of those exhibitions? Yes, some yes, but uh, mostly, you know, from Europe, not American art. And also I was told, you know, from the school, I, we cannot do like any different kind of art. Then schools kick you know, people out. And even uh, exhibition, I cannot do it. That's very strict. So presumably that was what then prompted you to, to move to New York in the late 50s. And before you actually began to exhibit in the 60s, can you tell us a little bit about the scene on your arrival? I know that you studied at the Art Students League of New York, where obviously a lot of really important figures of pop and abstraction and even minimalism studied. What was your experience of that setting? Uh, when I was, you know, I went to America and I picked New York because that is the only city for the, you know, the art is coming, you know, just start also over there. And uh, I saw those art. You know, there, and uh, then I was, you know, uh, I knew some people too, the artist friend, and uh, but I was so surprised, you know, doing those, you know, action painting, so called, and I never seen those before, I never heard of that, and uh, about. You know, one year or so, it's, you know, used to. And I thought, you know, this isn't, you know, what we want to do. So we must start our own art. Because it was a very crucial moment where you had the sort of abstract expressionism coming to an end and the colour field yes. segment mm -hmm. of that and then obviously people like Ad Reinhardt and, mm -hmm. and, and Stella who were doing that sort of reduction. Yeah. Um, what was their impact on you? I mean, of those who w did you feel the most attracted to, I would have thought the ones that were reducing yeah. like Reinhardt and Stella. Yeah. Uh, when I started, you know, at the, showing at the gallery, those years, uh, uh, like Stella also started, and we knew each other. And uh, I really liked his work. And, uh, but not much communication for the, you know, 
because I couldn't speak English. And so it was more of a visual yeah, conversation. Visual, yes, yeah, and also when I had the you know, first show at the New York, the 61, and uh, those years really America started for the new wave, like minimal art, base hope, or uh, pop art, conceptual art. That's you know, not yet, just... It's you know, just before just, that. Yeah. That's why it's such an interesting moment when something yeah. is mm -hmm. incipient and it's just about to happen. And in fact, I wanted to ask you about those first couple of exhibitions you did at the Green Gallery, which was a very influential showcase of some of that avant-garde art. And you had two solo exhibitions. And talking of your contemporaries who were tending towards reduction in form and color, it's interesting that you were still using those very strong primary colors and then later, obviously, more indeterminate colors. So what was your conception of color? I mean, presumably, you weren't using it in an expressive or an aesthetic way. But on the other hand, you weren't renouncing it entirely like people like Ad Reinhardt or Stella. And also, you know, these are about uh, 60, about 66 or you know, beginning of 65, 6, you know, something like that. Before that, I was doing those, the black one. And also, same time, I was doing spray metallic paint. I started. And uh, those are the, you know, I really, still now, I know why I did it. And, uh, and in that later exhibition, Systemic Painting at the Guggenheim yeah. that was curated by Lawrence Alloway, you started then to bisect the yeah. paintings mm -hmm. and, and add the metallic strips and of course you spray paint so yes. at that point you completely eliminate any kind of texture or, or gesture and was that because you wanted to make the works even more neutral and devoid yes. of mm -hmm. gesture and expression? Yeah. Those are they were started like the early 60s too you know and uh, especially you know, at the Early 60s, I started metallic, you know, spray paint. Then I worked more like you know, easy way to, I mean, how to call it, uh, use the acrylic paint and the surface also. I put those, you know, acrylic medium to erase the all human hand and more uh, neutral feeling. And then back to the 70s, mostly I did it for metallic spray paint. And the size is not those, the huge. And uh, when I showed that the Guggenheim one is just two panels jointed. And a uh, little bit different color for, because metallic means mixed with aluminum powder. So color itself, not like strong color. The, you know, more like a... It loses its clarity, of course, the color, and it becomes quite hard to define when you That's start right. adding... You cannot tell what is what. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, those are the you know, longest I did it. The still now, I, I like to do it again, but it's, I'm getting old. <laughs> it's hard, time, yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> And of course, inevitably, your work has been associated with minimalism. And early on, you also, in those early exhibitions, apart from the flat paintings, you start to make works that encroach onto the surrounding space, which in a way, I suppose, aligns them with what Donald Judd, Donald Judd calls specific objects. And of course, he reviewed some of your, your early work. Do you accept the fact that you've been inevitably associated with men minimalism? Uh, I knew people, you know. Actually, I didn't talk about art, yeah, but we are just, you know, because showing the same gallery. 
and uh, you know, we knew each other, of course. But uh, also, I was doing those years for group of the work. Yes, and I, of course, then you start. You later on, then you start to produce the work in in series, and you move away from that the single yes. object, uh -huh. and it becomes more environmental and yes, taking, yeah. mm -hmm. using the surrounding space. But initially, when at the moment of when you were being exhibited with people like Judd and Flavin, and did you feel a kind of belonging with those, or do you think that that label, if you like, of minimalism was, has been imposed by retrospective accounts of art history? Used to, you know, painting means uh, individually has a frame and hanging like, you know, uh, individually. But I did all those days, you know, group of the, my work. And uh, also, uh, I'm uh, trying to express, you know, color is not important. You know, the people, different taste. Color is just taste. So each, you know, quality of the surface is the same. That's why, you know, all evenly uh, put the aluminum medium to, I mean, uh, acrylic medium to, you know, shiny surface. And uh, because each individual is nothing to do with, you know, artist. That's I feel it. So you the idea that you're using color in different ways and yet at the same time you're saying it's not important, it's not inherently important. So why do you use, what role does color play in your work then? Because, you know, when, you know, the used to painting is people paint, right? And the brush mark or a composition and if you put the lead there, you need blue around here a little bit, or, you know, that is a painting those years. So I denied those. You know, nothing to do with color or those, you know, composition. Of course, the works we're seeing now are more in the format of a painting, but some of those early works that you produced were either or they would sort of turn corners or, yes, or have yeah, the yeah. edges kind That's of bent. That's I, I thought, you know, because for the wall also very important. You know, painting it against this wall, for instance, hanging like this on this space. I think, you know, this white part was for me very important. Same, same thing, you know, with those objects. And obviously we were talking about the impact of American painting, but of course at the same time there were many European avant-garde groups such as Zero and Azimut who were going, exploring similar directions. Were you aware of them at the time or did you have an interest in what, or have a feel and affinity with what they were doing? I think, you know, when I saw them, you know, of course, you know, some European also nice artwork, but they have the meaning too much for me. You know, they won't have something to tell. I don't like that. Even zero, though, do you think? Yes. Because they were, they yes. were at least they stated that they, yeah. they wanted to uh -huh. obliterate all meaning and, yeah. and start from zero, literally. But you disagree with that. That's right, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and eventually, as we were saying, you, you start to present the works in, in these all-encompassing environments, and then you also began to make these modular constructions using Bakelite and aluminium or yes. titanium elements. So was that also an endeavor to move away from the conventions of painting and... That's true, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And when, you know, the not the hanging, maybe put on there, and when the people see it, 
they feel something from there, you know, with wall. That kind of you know, art I wanted. I don't want to tell anything. I don't want to push people to see this way or that way. And in fact, interestingly, in 64, I think um, when you did the systemic exhibition at the Guggenheim, one of your statements was ideas, thoughts, philosophy, reasons, meanings, even the humanity of the artist do not enter into my work at all. Here is only the art itself. Do you still think that and do you still believe that nothing enters your art except for yes. itself? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so not, not everyone will really stand by a statement that they made such a long time ago. Maybe this is not a statement, but yeah. that is my feeling. It's your feeling. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, yeah. yes, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you very much to Doug. You're very welcome. <laughs>